Well, good morning. All right. Well, um, to kind of go back over what Michelle already said, my name is Jeremy Neely. Um, I'm part of a husband and wife duo called Neely with my wife. Uh, we couldn't get any more creative than that. We tried, and the names just stunk, so we just uh, we went the easy route and used our last name. Uh, we're from Nashville, Tennessee. We've been blessed to be able to do full-time music um, as a ministry for the last six years. Uh, we've traveled with our four daughters, and uh, now, now we've got three of them on the road. Uh, our, our oldest daughter, she married our, our longtime guitarist. And uh, she stole our guitarist away. Can you believe the nerve? <laughs> she was our strong-willed child, so we always make that joke, you know, because we were ready. We were ready for her to experience life. So, uh, but she had to steal our guitarist in the, in the meantime. So that's, that's kind of a look at who, who I am now. Um, prior to that, I, gr- I grew up in a small town outside of St. Joseph, Missouri, just uh, just east of there, called Cosby. It's a whopping metropolis. I'm, I would be surprised if you haven't seen it on a map. It's, uh, it's 121 people. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it, it would depend on how, how much you flick on your phone if you would even see Cosby at that, at that rate. I was raised into a, a great family. Um, my mom and dad, they, they loved the Lord. They served the church. They, uh, they had me at church anytime the doors were open, and sometimes because mom served so much, I was there when the doors weren't open. I, my uncles, uh, all my family dinners, I remember family dinners was always centered around conversations about the Lord because my uncles, they all served in some capacity, whether they were teaching elders or elders or, or pastors in their own right. So I was literally raised an inch from the truth, and I missed it. I let my peers guide me. I let media guide me. I let the, the, the trappings of this world guide me, and, and I ended up in uh, several illicit relationships that, that hurt my marriage before they ever started. Uh, I was, by the time I got married at the age of 21, I was a full-blown alcoholic and drug addict, um, even once I was saved in the summer of 2000, that's one of the things that, I, that the Lord really had to miraculously help me with is I had, a hard time, I had a hard time putting down the bottle and I had a hard time seeking out my next fix because, um, well, I just didn't deal, I didn't deal with my anger. I didn't deal with my hurt. And growing up in the church... I, I didn't know how to function as a Christian. I know that sounds odd, but I did not know how to function as a, as a Christ follower on a day-to-day basis. And you wonder, how does, how does that happen? How does that happen? But, I, but I'm here to tell you, and Paul talks about this in one of his letters um, about meat, meat and steak, right? Or, or milk and meat, right? He talks about that. I would liken that today in the church. We've got, imagine the, these halls right here. You've got a 12, 14, 15-year-old kid, and uh, instead of going to lunch through the caf- cafeteria lines, his mama comes in, and he goes, and they go off in the corner, and he nestles up and starts breastfeeding. That'd be kind of weird, right? <laughs> Likewise, if we've been in the church studying the Word of God for 12, 14 years, and we're still just a pew dweller coming because we need this routine or that routine or this little project or that little thing, and we're not going out and living out the life of Jesus Christ, I would say that you're, you're still spiritually breastfeeding, and it's kind of weird. And that's where I was at. That's where I was at. So, so what I want to do today is I want, to, I want to take a look at the book of Matthew 
as my mentor. I was so blessed. I had a, I had a mentor that came alongside me because after I was saved, I did what everybody else in Christendom does. I went out and I bought all kinds of books. I bought books by John MacArthur, I, and I, I was a good Christian. I read all the Left Behind series. <laughs> you, know, you know, and I went out and I bought Piper, and I bought Tozer, and I bought all... I had stacks of books, and I would just devour those. I would devour them. But I was feeding from the wrong... I was feeding from the wrong trough. And fortunately, I had a mentor that came alongside of me, and he helped me to see Matthew as it was designed as a discipleship manual. Now, I know that's, you know, there's, there's smarter guys out there than I that, that argue it, and I'll, I'll let them argue it, because it took, a, it took an angry, drug-infested, alcohol-addicted young man, his precept, that Matthew is a discipleship manual, and walking me through it for six, eight years, and at the end of those eight years, it was daily that he was walking me through this because I was so hungry because it's, it is, it's functional. So what I want to look at today is functional Christianity, but I want to parenthesis that. And I don't know, you know, I don't know the the, in, the proper English, you know, what does a parenthesis do? All I know is that when I look at it, it engulfs it. It's the beginning, it's the end, it's wrapped around. So I want to take Matthew 5, and I want to parenthesis that, with John 1. And why am I parenthesizing Matthew 5 with John 1? Well, because even in the book of Matthew 1 through 4, that's part of the discipleship manual, it describes who Jesus is. I mean, if you get through chapter 4 and you, you can't buy into this person of Jesus Christ, his lineage, you might as well probably just get off the bus at that point. Because it, otherwise, it's just going to kind of be like a Buddha-type good teaching, you know? But I like the preamble of John in this context just a little bit better, so that's why I'm going to parenthesis it with John today. So let's, let's, uh, let's just get right into Scripture, and let's read John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light. But he came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about Him and cried out, This was He whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because He was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. This is a beautiful picture, right? But if you really start to think about it, For me, anyways, this is convicting. This is convicting. Right right from the beginning, it's convicting. If we really really take this in and look at it in a functional, like real life sense, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything that was made. In him was life. And it goes on. And it goes on even to, to really tie it in. So basically we have the word is God. God is the word. The word is Jesus. Jesus is the word. Jesus is God. God is Jesus, right? It's just this big circular thing. It's just one and the same. So what I'm wanting to say is that when we're spiritually breastfeeding, that means you take your life individually, I take my life, and I put it over the life as we see it in these Gospels, the life of Jesus Christ. And if we don't just disappear and all you can see is the life of Jesus Christ exuding from our lives, we don't know the Word. If we don't know the Word, we don't know God. If we don't know the Word, we don't know Jesus. You see what I'm saying? We're, we're playing a game in this country. I'm, I've been playing a game. A verse, verse here, a verse, verse there, here a verse, there a verse, everywhere a verse, verse. Or, or you know, it's funny how some of the high church has trickled into what we do in our gatherings. We come here on Sunday mornings and we pay our penance. But our true worship is shown in how we live our lives, right? For a lot of us, we worship our kids. And our kids are in every stinking sports thing and we run ragged living out their dreams because they've lived a long life and they, they deserve to have their dreams fulfilled right now, right? <laughs> That's a, whole nother, that's a whole nother topic. I'm just, what I'm showing is how even within the church, we have gotten away from the life of Jesus Christ and having that so much a part of who we are in the fabric of us. Is it no wonder why we're in a decline in this country? Let's turn over to chapter 5 in Matthew. Because I said I want a parenthesis Matthew chapter 5, because I, the way I was taught it, Matthew chapter 5 is like the beginning of functional Christianity. I, my, my mentor called it a spiritual barometer, which actually probably means more for y'all up here in Maine, being closer to the sea, you know, and, you know, the lobster. <laughs> I always called it a lobster, but I learned up here it's a lobster. Because, you know... It, he didn't call it a spiritual thermometer because a thermometer is linear. All it measures is temperature. A barometer takes in the whole atmosphere. And it gives you a picture of the whole atmosphere and what's going on out there. And moment by moment, it changes. In a blink of an eye, I mean, we, we lived in Kansas for a lot of years. In a blink of an eye, you could have a, a thunderstorm crawling up on you and uh, you're taking cover. Just that fast. Things change, and so it is in life. The Beatitudes are our spiritual barometer. Jesus, he didn't empty himself to come dwell on this earth, subject himself to the same temptation that you and I are subjected to, to just get nailed to the cross, go to the grave, die, and then say, Deuces, I'm out. He, did, he didn't do that. You, you would think that the one that spun all this in motion, as I said earlier, and set the, the universe on a razor's edge, if anything is out of balance, just even the fraction of a hair, the whole universe falls apart. You would think that he would give us something, meat and potatoes, that we can function off of. And that's what he did right here. He starts out functionally where we can memorize this, take it in, write it on our hearts, and we can look at where we're at moment by moment, day by day. Let's go right on into it. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, I always ask people, 
you know, who's poor in spirit? And everybody kind of looks around, and you, they don't, the hands kind of go up and down. So I, I rephrase it the way that my mentor rephrased it. How many of you are poor in oxygen? Anybody poor in oxygen? All right, for those of you that do not think that you're poor in oxygen, let's do a little test. I like science experiments. I was always a science kid. Take a breath, pinch your nose, cover your mouth, and count to 500. (laughs) Yeah, you find out really quick that you are poor in oxygen. The same way we are poor in spirit. When we realize that we need the Spirit of God... In the summer of 2000, when my marriage was falling apart, my my older two daughters didn't really care to be around their daddy all that much. When I was just a shell of the man that I was raised to be, I realized I need God. I need the one that just spoke, and these things called trees just pop into existence. I need that I need that person in, in my life. Blessed are those who mourn. See, it's not, it's not enough just to realize that you need the person of God, the Spirit of God in you. There's a mourning process that has to go on. Any of you all want to like, get to the meat and taters of what mourning is? If you've ever been to a child's funeral and you're sitting there and you're looking at the casket with a two-year-old in it, in your spirit, all that you want, if you could give it all up just for that child to have another breath and to live a long life. So let's rephrase that, that emotion. Mourning. You do not like the situation, and you want it to change. When I recognized that I needed the Spirit of God in my life, I began to mourn. I began to mourn my choices. I began to mourn my actions. I began to mourn who I had become, and I wanted change. I did not want to be that person Now, for some people, they're miraculously healed at the time of salvation. And the Lord just delivers them. That wasn't me. It's been a battle. It still is a battle. There are things that I deal with on a daily basis that, that, uh, that stem from my actions as a young man that I still, at 41 years of age, am battling. And I probably will battle them until I go home to be with the Lord. Blessed are those who mourn, but it's not enough just to mourn where you're at and desire change. Blessed are the meek. Now, a lot of people say that, they they try to, to say that meek is humble. Let me ramp up the humility on meekness just a little bit. Teachable. Have you ever seen somebody that's broken that does not want to be addicted or whatever, and you give them suggestions, maybe even godly suggestions on how to live their lives and how to rid themselves, and the first thing they do is they're like, I got this. I know what I'm doing. That is not meekness. And you can see how the process, just the brakes are applied. If we get to this point to where we know that we're needing the Spirit of God, we're mourning where we're at, we're mourning the situation, but we're not teachable, you might as well just be spinning your wheels because that's what you're doing. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. The reason I told you some of my testimony the way it was is when I got saved, I told you I read Piper, I read this, I read that, and I read, I read all these, these different guys. I was feeding from the wrong trough. I needed to go straight to the source. I needed to go straight to Jesus Christ. I needed to soak in Him for a while. 
I didn't need all these other ideologies. As a matter of fact, I was reading those guys more than I was reading my Bible. They were filling my thoughts, my mind, my heart with the image of God. I wasn't going directly to the source. So when you're teachable, you see where the process, the process just doesn't stop one to the next, one to the next. That's why this is a barometer. You got to hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's not enough to be teachable because you can go to the wrong trough. You can feed at the wrong buffet. Might be the one that gets you sick. Blessed are those who are merciful. You see, when I fed from the wrong trough, I wasn't merciful. I, as a matter of fact, I became self-righteous. Last night, we, we sang a song that, that, that I wrote called Everything I Am, which is my artistic retelling of Mary in the Alabaster Jar. And in that song, I, um, I tried to encompass the three prevalent spirits in the room. The very contrite, humble, broken spirit of Mary crawling into the room, knowing she's the bottom rung of the social ladder, but desiring more, knowing there's more. Then you see the person of Jesus, how he reacted. Then you got that other spirit, the self-righteous spirit. The disciples had it that night. The religious leaders had it that night. They beat her up. They weren't showing her mercy. The mercy they were given, the mercy we're all given. You see, we put a price tag on sin. And it seems like somehow ours always manages to be a lower cost than our neighbor's. They seem to always have a higher ticket price on their sin. Sinners. It isn't usually until we desire mercy. We fall in such a way that it might ruin our relationship at home, a relationship within our family, relationship with one of our best friends, and we're just pleading I don't, I don't know why I did it. Sin doesn't have a reason. It, it's not a logical thing. Sin, really, if you look at it, sin isn't logical. And you're pleading with them. In, the, in that moment, you, you really understand what mercy is because you want it. Oh, you want it. Especially if you're begging with your spouse. That's how I learned what mercy was. Blessed are the pure in heart. Man. When you start acting in mercy, true mercy, and you see people as they are, created but flawed, hurting, they have hopes, fears, joy, pain, just like you do. When you start to see that, or as Jesus summed it up in the two great commandments, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. There's a pureness of heart there. Because you're not dis- when you when you love somebody as yourself, you're not you're not expecting anything in return. You're you're working in, in that mercy area. I mean, we see, it, we see it lived out. We just celebrated Easter not too long ago. We see, we see mercy lived out. Have you thought about that? The pureness of heart there? He didn't have to do that. He didn't have to do any of that. He was acting in mercy for the sake of mankind, his creation, in a pureness of heart. And that's the example that we're called to live after. And you know, if some of you get to the point to where it's like, well, I do love my neighbor as myself. You know, 
that's, that's pretty dangerous territory right there because when I got to thinking that I was at that place, the Lord, the Lord ramped it up a little bit. He taught me something about my self-preservation instincts. You see, if somebody came right down that hallway and bu- burst in here with, with guns and started shooting, you know what I would do? Well, I'd like to tell you what I'd do, you know, especially a couple hours from Bangor where, you know, Pastor Ken <laughs> is at. I would like to tell you that I'm a manly man, a wannabe Navy SEAL, and I would just start hurtling these rows right here, and I'd probably take the first bullet and just shrug it off, and I'd keep running. But the reality is, is I would, in an act of self-preservation, probably duck right here, or I would take cover. That's the honest truth. That's a pretty deep-rooted love. And we're called to love our neighbor, the people that we encounter, with that same deep-rooted love. That's pure in heart right there. Blessed are the peacemakers. You know, growing up in in the St. Joe, Missouri area, I wasn't too far from Kansas. And so, uh, to me, the peacemaker was a Colt 45 that sat on Wyatt Earp's hip. And, and, you know, there's all kinds of other descriptions that we try to make of peacemakers. But let me tell you what a true peacemaker is. A true peacemaker is my mentor. Or maybe that person in your life that took the opportunity to love you with that sticky, merciful, pure of heart love when you didn't deserve it. And he led you to Jesus Christ. He led you to the well that will never go dry. He led you to the, they led you to the bread of life. That is a peacemaker. That's what I want to become. That's what I want to fight for, is I want to become that guy that acts in mercy, in a pureness of heart, with that sticky love. You know, you know what I'm talking about, those people with the sticky love? It's the Christians that you just want to hate them. But when life falls apart, who do you run to? You run to them because they just, they've got that Jesus love, that sticky love, you know? Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the disciplers. That's how I like to say it. The ones who disciple after Jesus Christ because that is peace. I never found peace in another dead-end relationship. I never found peace at the end of a, a bottle. I never found peace with buying another thing and having money. I never found it. Never found peace by being up on stage and all these accolades. I never found peace like Jesus Christ can bring. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. I would like to tell you, I would like to tell you that this would be at the hands of something, somebody like. ISIS or some terrorist group that uh, that's where we're going to find our persecution or maybe from our government being overrun by whomever, you know. The honest to goodness is, is it's going to come from right within the body. We read it right in our parentheses. Jesus Christ is light and the darkness flees. He's light. When you get to the point to where in your life you're walking so close to Him, like I said before, and and our life becomes transparent, that means we're starting to walk in light and we're starting to, that light's shining. And guess what? I've been here. This is, again, this goes back to that Mary in the Alabaster Jar story. With the, with the self-righteous religious, and I am that person more than I care to admit to you. That persecution is going to come from within the body. 
It might be just some kind of jest, you know, because that kid, he's on fire. Whoa, 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 settle down, buddy. You're making us all look bad. Or it may just be some of the rumors that we start around trying to undercut their ministry. Constantly taking their legs out from underneath them. Or maybe if the body as a whole is doing that transparent. We're just, as a body, we're just doing some amazing things for the glory of Jesus Christ. Guess what? The other churches in the community, Bible-believing churches, Bible-teaching churches with good, spirit-filled people, all of a sudden, they start saying things, mean things, untrue things trying to unravel what's being done. You see what I'm saying? And it can just go from there. I, I've been in situations where I've seen people go into to elders meetings trying to discredit and cast out a believer that is exposing their darkness. That Really, that's what it comes down to. Their, their life is exposing something in them that they don't want to look at right now. So they persecute that brother. Or sister. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You see, this is a badge of honor. When we start walking... In this, in this thing, this functional Christianity thing, this, as, as Paul says it in Romans 8, Romans 8, he says, I predeter- the Lord predetermined from the dawn of man when he created mankind that he would look like Jesus Christ. Now, some people run with that and they go, predestination, Calvinism, da 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 da. I'm like, all right, whatever you want to do there, buddy. But literally what it's saying is God predetermined his hope for mankind was that Adam would look like the life of Jesus Christ. His hope was that Jeremy Neely would look like Jesus Christ. His hope was, insert your name, would look like Jesus Christ. That's what his hope was for mankind. We're the ones who kind of screw that up. Let's keep reading here. Because this is, this, is this is the important part. And this is where the Lord, before he starts to attack in Matthew, he starts to really go into those, those touchy spots. You know, like anger and lust, greed, you know, those kind of things. He goes through a a few things here where he starts talking about you're the salt of the earth. And if the salt loses its flavor, it's good for nothing but being trampled on. You want to know how to keep that good flavor? You want to know the recipe for it? Use tools like the Beatitudes to operate in the life of Jesus Christ. To imitate him. To become what God predetermined that mankind should look like from the beginning. That's the salt of the earth. And when you start looking at it through that lens, when you start looking at life, when you start looking at church in North America through that, through that lens, that lens of Jesus Christ, and with that perception, all of a sudden... You start to wonder, how, how did we get here doing all this stuff? And it starts to, starts, to, starts to crank on you just a little bit. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. It goes back to John 1. He's the light. And in light, darkness, it can't dwell. You see, 
the life of Jesus Christ, the life that God had hoped mankind would embrace and live out all their days on this earth when he created us. It's like a, it's like a city on a hill. Have you all ever seen anything like that? Being from Kansas, I can tell you, man, there's sometimes you see that, you see that glow. You see that glow of that city. And you may think, wow, that's just right over the horizon, you know. In my case, the older I get, it seems like the smaller my bladder gets. And so I see that, I see that glow on the horizon, I'm like, hallelujah, relief is coming soon. But out there in the flatlands, that glow is, it could be another half hour or 45 minutes away. That's how much that light radiates through the darkness. That's the hope that Jesus Christ has for us in our lives. That's why he gives us functional tools like the Beatitudes. And it doesn't stop with the Beatitudes. It goes through the whole discipleship process through Matthew. Luke, John, look at any of the letters that, that Paul wrote. What is, what is the main point of all of Paul's letters? It isn't the length of hair or headdresses or this or that or any of the things that we argue about in church. If you boil those letters down, each one of them, you will see the main point will always boil down to be imitators of Jesus Christ. Be imitators of God. Imitate me as I imitate Jesus Christ. It all boils, no matter how he says it, it all boils down to the same thing. Be imitators of Jesus Christ. So as, as we pray here to close, I'll, I'll have my wife come back up and we're going to sing another song together and we're just going to praise God and thank him today for giving us something functionally that we can grab a hold of and we can go out there and live in life. Because I don't know about you, but the stuff that I've still got in here that I am dealing with, as Paul would call them, the thorns in the flesh, I get tired of it. I get sick and tired of it. But there's hope. There's a plan. There's a way to handle it. There's, there's functional. There's functionality in this life. And if you would take the time to look through the book of Matthew at the very least in such a manner, you're going to find just that. <laughs>